In lecture six, we'll be going over cohort and case control studies. This lecture is going to be divided between two videos. The first part is going to focus more on case control, and the second video will focus more on cohort studies. The objectives of this lecture are that at the end, you should be able to calculate and interpret odds, ratios, and relative risk. You should be able to differentiate between case control studies and cohort studies in terms of design and the causal arguments that can be made from each. And you should be able to identify the presence of selection bias and information biases in cohort studies and case control studies. So prior to germ theory of disease, hand washing and antiseptic use was uncommon in healthcare, even in hospital settings. So you can imagine there was high mortality rates. In current times, hand washing is thought to be so important that it's deemed unethical to randomize patients to a group in which no hand washing is mandated. So for instance, if I wanted to know if, uh, mort if mortality of patients was uh, associated with hand washing or not, I can't do an RCT on mortality between patients who are treated by hand washing doctors versus non hand washing doctors. However, what I can do is I can run an observational study. So the first ob observational study we'll cover is a case control study. Okay. In the mid-1800s, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis noticed something interesting about two obstetric clinics. One clinic, which was staffed by doctors, had mortality rates in pregnant women of 8 to 12 percent from a disease known as childbed fever. The other clinic, staffed by midwives, had a mortality rate of only 2 to 3 percent. Okay, so if we think that hand washing is important um, and can, you know, uh, and if you don't wash your hands can lead to mortality, how can we use a case control study to look at this? Okay, so if we step back and look at our hierarchy of evidence again, our two observational studies that we're talking about, cohort and case control, fall kind of in the middle on the quality of evidence. They're below an RCT, but because it's not ethical to do an RCT, these are our next best options. So we're gonna do a case control study. The quality of evidence is a bit lower than the quality of evidence from a cohort study. Case control study is an observational study in which two groups, one being cases, who have the outcome of interest and controls who don't have the outcome of interest are assessed for differences in the frequency of exposures. So if we review case control classification, this should be familiar from previous lectures, these are analytical studies because they're designed to assess a relationship. Case control is always going to be retrospective because the outcome has already occurred. Case control studies are quasi-experimental. Groups are chosen based on pre-existing differences between patients. And patients are assigned to groups based on those outcomes. Case control studies are useful to study relationships and populations and RCTs aren't feasible. However, in some studies, it might be difficult to determine that cause precedes effect. So if we review the causality assessment of case control studies, is there experimentation? No, we're not intervening. We're not doing anything like that. Can we be sure or ensure that cause precedes effect? No. However, we can look at individual associations. So if we plug in our information from the scenario into this little flowchart, our sample is gonna be pregnant women at OB clinics. We're gonna group patients based on their outcome. So that means women who died and women who lived. And then we're gonna compare frequencies of hand washing among providers. <clears throat> so strengths of case control studies, they're really useful when an outcome of interest is rare because it has already been, uh, it, they have already uh, have the outcome. So it's easy to identify those patients. Capable of drawing comparisons between groups. Uh, weaknesses must be retrospective, reliant on pre-existing data, less certainty that cause precedes effect, not randomized, 
and it's vulnerable to selection bias, so it can be difficult to select an appropriate matched control group. In case control studies, because there is no follow-up period like there is in a cohort study, we can't calculate relative risk. So in, in a case control study, instead, we use an odds ratio. So we're saying, what is the odds of this outcome happening if in patients that were exposed to one condition versus those that were not exposed to it? Since they already have the outcome, we can't look at risk of the outcome, okay? Odds ratio describes the strength of a relationship between exposure and disease occurrence in case control studies. So here is uh, the odds ratio equation, how you calculate it. So you get the odds of exposure in cases and the odds of exposure in controls. And so you can see this odds ratio here. An odds ratio is similar to relative risk in and it does approximate relative risk in case control studies when the outcome is rare. So the more rare an outcome, the better approximation of the odds ratio is of the relative risk. The less rare um, an outcome is, the more the odds ratio value will diverge from relative risk. So how do we calculate the odds ratio? Let's do this an example here. So for our study, the investigators identified 5,000 women who died following childbirth from associated OB clinics. They then matched these women to 10,000 women who gave birth but did not die. So we're going to calculate the odds that provider hand washing was associated with the outcome of mortality. So there's the odds ratio equation. I'm going to take those values from my table here, plug those in, and I get an odds ratio of 0.54. Now we need to take that and we need to interpret and understand what that means. So how do we go about doing that? Well, a general rule of thumb for interpreting odds ratios, and, the same, and this can also be applied to relative risk, and I'll show you that later when we cover cohort studies, but an odds ratio equal to one means that the odds of exposure among cases are the same or similar to the odds of exposure among controls. In other words, the outcome is not associated with the exposure. If an odds ratio is greater than 1, this means that the odds of exposure among cases are greater than the odds of exposure among controls. In other words, the exposure may be a risk factor for the outcome. And if an odds ratio is less than 1, the odds of exposure among cases are lower than the odds of exposure among controls. The exposure might be a protective factor against the outcome. At our odds ratio of 0.54, so what does that mean? So since it's less than 1, the odds of exposure among cases are lower than the odds of exposure among controls. So now let's write this out, our interpretation and this result out, okay? And I want you to follow these steps. This is an, uh, hopefully an easy way to figure out the interpretation and understand what this means. So first, you're going to take the odds ratio, and if it's less than 1, you're going to convert it into a percentage by doing 1 minus the odds ratio times 100, which in this case will give you a percentage of 46. Um, note that if the odds ratio were greater than 1, then you would do odds ratio minus 1 times 100. Okay? I take this percentage and I say there is a 46% decrease in odds of death in patients being cared for by a provider who washes their hands compared to patients cared for by a provider who does not. An inappropriate interpretation of the odds ratio, because sometimes people think that odds ratio and relative risk are the same thing, but they're not. And so this would be inappropriate. Patients being cared for by a provider who washes their hands have a 46% reduction in risk of mortality compared to patients being cared for by a provider who does not. Remember, we're not measuring risk, we're measuring odds. Some common case control biases. So control selection bias. It can be difficult to match cases and controls on all the important criteria. So bi biases can hap happen, for instance, if the cases are taken from a rural OBGYN, however, the controls are taken from an advanced medical center, 
The patients at the Advanced Medical Center might get improved care, might have better health insurance, economic status, a variety of other things that could be contributing to mortality, okay, besides just the hand washing. There's recall bias in a case control study. So this implies deficits in the memory. So it occurs when one group is more likely to recall events than another group. So for instance, control patients may be more likely to report having had an antiseptically cleansed surgeon, whereas case exposure may be assessed by deceased woman's family who remember more clearly. There's also a risk of reporting bias. So this occurs when one group is more likely to report what they actually remember. And in particular, you want to be careful on how you assess the outcome. So if we're asking doctors if they wash their hands or not, I'm guessing that doctors who didn't wash their hands, they might lie and say they did, which could bias our results towards the mean. So let's look at an example of how bias can affect things. So our good friend, Dr. Semmelweis, has decided to assess his exposures by asking every physician who operated on the patient whether they washed their hands after they left the morgue. Most physicians adamantly deny this claim. In 500 cases and controls, the incidence of no hand washing appears to be the same. This is uh, shown in the left-hand table. So there's no difference in the number of cases and controls in each of these cells, the odds ratio is one. However, if we had assessed the outcome differently by looking at whether hand washing was documented in the medical chart, now we see that hand washing is much lower in actuality, and our odds ratio is now 0.17. So now we want to kind of uh, compute the magnitude of bias. So we want to look at the measurement of the impact of bias on this association. Magnitude equals observed association minus actual. So we plug in our OR values from the previous slide and we get a magnitude of 0.83. Now we want to ask, does the bias pull toward the null, making the association look less significant, or away from the null, making the association look more significant? So in this case, our observed odds ratio, if I plot that on this little figure here, is 1. And then our actual is 0.17. You'll see that the observed is pulling us towards the null, making the association look less significant. This concludes this video. The second video, we will start with cohort studies.